Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I expect that you can hear me. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the town hall that we're having this morning. Um, we hope to be able to answer as many questions as possible uh, during this hour um, on both the plan to return to you as well as um, uh, budget questions. But we really want to be able to open it up to everyone to be able to do that. Um, I asked the provost uh, earlier this week, she asked if she could, we announced this last Friday, she asked if she could hold a, a, a similar meeting for faculty earlier this week, um, and we thought that was a great idea. Um, I, I really want to extend my appreciation for the provost to doing that, as well as to all the faculty that were involved in it. I heard it was a very, very beneficial meeting. Uh, I want to share the fact that if you have further follow-up questions from that meeting or you couldn't attend that meeting, Please, you know, just just ask the questions that you want to ask. We want to make sure that we provide as much information as we possibly can to everyone. Um, we also uh, uh, want to be able to take the time to introduce everybody. So let me start with saying that I'm Kim Schatzel. I'm the president of Towson University. We also have here this morning Ben Lowenthal, who is the vice president of administration and finance and is the chief financial officer of TU. Uh, as I said, we have Melanie Perot, who is the Provost and Executive Vice President for uh, Academic Affairs. And we also have Vernon Hurt, who is the Vice President for Student Affairs. So we hope that we've brought all the people uh, that, that could answer the questions to the panel itself. Before we start, I, I want to uh, take some time to talk about um, uh, the events that have been occurring around uh, the, the metropolitan area of greater Baltimore, across the nation, across the globe. All of us have witnessed the video and all of us have heard about the, uh, the killing of, of Mr. George Floyd uh, at the hands of police um, in Minneapolis. Um, this is not the first event of, of law enforcement brutality that has resulted, nor the first, in, the first incidents of violence motivated by racism that we've seen either in the last few months or weeks or decades as we go back to be able to consider this. Uh, Ahmad Avery was recently murdered as well. And uh, that young man was just jogging down a street and was attacked by two white individuals and, and taken down in the street. Um, Brianna Taylor was a first responder who was asleep in her home when police officers using the no-knock law came and in invaded her home and ended up resulting in her death. Uh, we recently also saw two college students, Ms. Pilgrim and Mr. Young, that were pulled out of a car in Atlanta, and they were tased and they were assaulted. One of the things that I know that I can say that all of us share is the fact that this type of brutality, this type of uh, injustice that is resulting from structural racism, it's got to stop. It absolutely has to stop. Um, we know the fact that uh, in 2018, the American Public Health Association declared law enforcement brutality a public health issue. It has to change. But we also have to take a look at structural racism that has continued in this country that has resulted in the fact that not just the issues of police brutality that has exacerbated socioeconomic issues for our communities of color, but also has resulted in the fact that the COVID-19 pan epidemic has had disproportionate impact on those communities as well as the fact that zip codes are the biggest determinant of not only will you go to college, not only what your lifetime earnings are, but also will you be incarcerated or what your life expectancy can be. It has to stop. It has to stop on this campus. It has to stop in this community. We are deeply committed to inclusion and diversity, but we have much to learn and we are deeply committed able to foster that within Greater Baltimore and our state. Over the next few days, I'm going to be meeting with members of the community, faculty, staff, and students to be able to talk about this more, what we can do more, but I can commit to you the fact that we need to be able to make this to stop. I can share that it is on, I, I will not be next in terms of this violence, but I have many, many people who I love that could be next, so we're going to be part of making this stop, and it must stop. Well, I, I can't find an effective way to be able to transition um, from this most, you know, serious and sad and angry piece of what we've talked about. 
but um, why don't we move to the questions? Uh, Marina Cooper is the Vice President of University uh, Communications and Marketing, and she'll be handling the chat and she'll be giving some information about how we're going to be handling the session. So, Marina, could you fill everyone in? Yes, good morning, everyone. We will uh, begin with question and answers. If you look to your right, you should see opportunity uh, to, to write in a question to the panel. We will be using that. Um, and also, if you are in need of live captioning, as we as you saw in the welcome message, you can just use Towson.edu uh, backslash captions. So you will have the opportunity to do some live captioning there. Our first question. Our first question is, have there been any student surveys to determine their relative support for either in person or hybrid um, or even online classes this fall? That's a. That's the first question, and I'll, I will let the president begin with that and perhaps move on to the provost. Um, we've not conducted any surveys across the university itself. Um, um, I can share with you the fact that when we announced it, um, my inbox got filled, and I think the provost can be able to share that as well. Um, uh, there was, I, you know, as an informal survey, half of the folks, half of the students are saying it's fantastic that we want to be able to come back. Half of the students are concerned, I think, as a lot of others are. Um, and I think that's just what we're dealing with in terms of, of these types of changes. Um, um, I'll let the provost add to see if she's gotten feedback in terms of the students. And also, uh, Vernon, if you've heard as well, but we've we've not run any, any formal survey. Right, so, uh, um, you know, we have the mechanism to respond to the return to TU plan. So we've been collecting those comments and those are from students, faculty, staff, parents, uh, general community members, and uh, they're running roughly the same, um, as you say, indicate President Schatzel, that there's the the, the mixture of uh, folks who want to be online and uh, people who would prefer face-to-face. -face. And um, so we are responding with the high flexibility, high flexibility, low density model for the return to campus, uh, because we think that is uh, the model that will serve the entire community best uh, while uh, maintaining academic integrity and health and safety as being the priority. I would just briefly add, uh, although we have not uh, done a broad survey of, of students, we've been very intentional about engaging our uh, student government association leadership. Uh, our new administration just started a few weeks ago, and so we uh, do have student representation as a part of the return to TU uh, task team. So it's been really important uh, to have their um, ongoing involvement and feedback as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question uh, is from Mike. Let's, it says, uh, what are the exact start and end dates for the fall semester? So I'm going to give that one to uh, Provost Perot as um, that is part of the academic calendar. So uh, thank you. So we just shifted everything one full week. So the first uh, day of classes is Monday, August 24th. And um, off the top of my head, I can't remember the uh, 23rd. Day, but I'm sorry. I think it's the 23rd of November. I'm going to go with the, the president on that one. So uh, a week earlier. So everything simply was shifted up uh, precisely one week. So the last day of on campus is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, and I think Provost, they might be asking what's the last official day of the academic calendar. We know we're leaving campus on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. But what's the last day? But the day would be, uh, I think, part of the question. Right. That's a, so right. So the whole calendar shifted up one one week. And uh, as the president says, we have made the decision to go to remote learning uh, after Thanksgiving. So there's two weeks of classes and then the final exam period. Thank you. Our next question. Um, is regarding layoffs. So during the last town hall on April 22nd, it was stated that furloughs and layoffs were not being considered. Um, and this message has continued across the administration for the next several weeks. Um, what has, has anything changed and what, if anything, has changed in the last six weeks um, in terms of further conditions or changes that would need to exist um, to see furloughs and layoffs become a reality? And then there's a follow up to that question, if I could. Um, and if they do, how will those decisions be made and what types of actions would be taken? If, if I can start with it and then Ben, I'll ask you to follow up. 
Um, we, we, you know, we incurred about $30 million worth of losses for the fiscal 20 year, which ends the end of June. And we've done a tremendous amount of forecasting and scenario modeling in terms of taking a look at what we can expect for the fall. Um, and I can share with you that the, the enrollments look good for the fall, which is, which is a plus. We've also modeled, though, the fact that um, uh, we're, we're going to be taking about 1,000 beds offline uh, because of the fact that we need to go to low density in the residence halls. So, so that's been put into it. We've also looked at the fact that we're not going to have any third party events on campus. Uh, and the reason for that is that we don't want to have, we just don't want to increase the complexity of the campus. We just don't want to be doing things that we, that we don't need to do uh, to be able to have visitors come on and have events that are not part of the community. That, that will provide another, about another million dollars worth of, of losses, but we think it's important. Um, it also provides the um, the provost and the, and the faculty and the department chairs and the deans with the opportunity to use West Village campus uh, and the West Village buildings uh, to, for, as classrooms. So we're going to put them online as classrooms rather than have them for events. So we'll just add for bigger space as well for the capacity. With all of that and what we've looked at in terms of what we, we can see, if we are absolutely fiscally prudent, which we believe we can be, we have confidence that we can be, fiscally prudent, uh, we will not need to go to layoffs or furloughs in terms of being able to manage for this upcoming academic and fiscal year. I can tell you the fact that it's a priority for me, and I think my leadership team can say the same thing, that we're going to take care of the people that are at Towson University, the faculty and the staff. And the reason for that is the fact that we are going to come out of this. This is, this is, this is a pandemic. This is not something uh, that was brought on from a nat from an economic situation. This is actually because of of, uh, of viruses, we all know, and we want to be prepared to come out of this uh, hole uh, and to be able to have our uh, most valuable resource, which is our people, intact. Uh, so I feel very very strongly about that. Uh, it will be absolutely a last resort uh, that we will use, uh, and uh, we all have to do this together. So this. This means the fact that we're being extremely, extremely cautious with regard to hiring. We have a hiring chill, as I call it on, which is the fact that we're not going to be making hires unless they're absolutely necessary for the operations of the university or for efforts that we need with regard to the pandemic. Similarly, we've stopped all um, uh, construction uh, unless it's directly related to either the science complex, the university union, um, as and College of Health Professions, we're doing planning in that. Uh, but if it's other than those, and it's not directly related to either university operations that we need to do, or to uh, expenses associated with preparing for COVID-19 return to campus, we're not going to do it. So uh, austerity, we're going to find some some holes in our belt loops that we that we need to pull to pull tight. But given that, and we all do that, um, I'm confident that we can avoid layoffs and furloughs. Um, ben, do you want to add? Uh, as President Satzel said, there, there is the, the primary point over here is to protect our primary resource, which is all of you, the faculty and staff of Towson University. We've been modeling many, many scenarios depending on what is going to come down from the state. We've been working closely with the University System of Maryland as well. And as the president said, we do feel confident at this point given all that we have and what we painted in our scenario that we are able to weather the storm because we are in strong financial position before we entered the pandemic crisis. And we immediately acted to freeze the hiring and really any major purchases as well. So your cooperation going forward in 21 and keeping expenditures to absolutely essential items is really gonna be important to enable us to go forward in this manner. One additional point is that um, Armory Startup in Fort Worth, Washington will also continue construction. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. And I just want to follow up as well um, on the academic calendar question. We did get a follow up from the registrar's office that um, the academic calendar begins August 24th and ends December 14th. Online instruction will, be, will begin the Tuesday before uh, before Thanksgiving break and continue through finals. Again, finals will be online only, and the last day of classes will be December 7th, with finals being December 8th through the 14th. So I want to thank the Office of the Reg Registrar, as well as one of our faculty members, Sid, for, for making sure that we got those exact details uh, to everyone live here today. So thank you. 
Moving on to the next question, uh, and it is a question about uh, speaking to the options for fully online courses for students in the fall. Um, will there be courses that are fully online for students this fall? Do we have a timeline to share more details with students regarding that option? Absolutely. So um, we are working right now uh, to um, understand what faculty plans are. Uh, there will be some courses that are entirely online and other courses that are in a high flexibility um, hybrid model so that uh, under any circumstance, if a student does not feel comfortable uh, coming to campus, they will be able to have uh, be able to uh, participate in the class either directly online or through the, the hybrid model. And likewise, uh, you know, we're, we've we've taken the position and it's a strong position that anybody who uh, does not feel comfortable coming to campus for whatever reason has the option to determine that for themselves and then uh, in, in that case then the faculty would be delivering the course online. So we are working within the next week we will issue a survey to both faculty and staff to understand um, what they are, uh, are thinking about the fall and we will then start to identify the individual courses that will be delivered strictly online and those courses that will be delivered in a hybrid fashion and those will then be indicated in the course schedule. So uh, it's all coming forward. We'll have that uh, survey out within the next week. And so we can anticipate in the next uh, maybe two weeks after that being able to start really identifying and nailing down which classes will be delivered in which format. And if I could just add on what the provost shared also extends to staff, it's faculty and staff. Um, we understand when we started taking a look at this that you know there there's certain high risk groups that either are, are are either diabetic or have high blood pressure over the age of 65 have immunosuppression. Um, when we looked at it further, we also realized the fact that there's uh, people that have individuals in their homes that have those types of conditions as well that would cause concern for them to return. I gave the example of the fact that we could have a, a staff member who um, is divorced, they have an eight-year-old child that comes to their house that, for, a, for a visit, um, uh, you know, the third weekend of every month and the child has cystic fibrosis and they would be concerned to come to campus to be exposed the week before that and what would they do? The point is, is that there's going to be numerous, numerous examples that are going to be presented in terms of what this looks like. And so we want everyone to understand that we're going to be supportive in a very broad way of what people want to be able to do and what they're comfortable with. Um, we're going to be able to, of course, we have to work together to be able to figure out how the work is done. We're going to stress telework, as the provost says, we're going to stress remote. We also just don't want students, faculty, or staff to wake up in the morning and they have a fever and they feel like they have to be compelled to come. We want you to stay home. Because of that, we have to have all these different flexible ways to be able to do this. And we have to be able to now start surveying to be able to put a plan together that can address them. So it's going to take all of us working together to stay flexible. It's going to take all of us to be able to work together to trust and support each other. But I know that we can do it in the end. It will create the best outcome both for our uh, faculty and staff as well as for our students. And we're planning this all over uh, you know, the next two and a half months. Um, so more to come on this and, and we're going to be reaching out to everybody to get information from you and to be able to share more information. Great, thank you. Next question is about the limitations um, of on campus events um, and, and with those limitations and the physical distancing that will be required on campus, how will students uh, be encouraged to stay on campus rather than going home? Um, while also staying safe? This is a question about during the semester and a question that I will um, pose to the panel, but um, perhaps uh, Vice President Hurt could lead. Sure. So one of the things we, we want to absolutely have is um, a healthy sense of campus life. And so uh, from our student activities office to a, a number of uh, campus partners across student affairs and across the university, you know, we're really looking at how do we provide as a robust as possible uh, sense of campus life. Uh, and so I, you know, for example, I know our, our leadership and uh, campus recreation is looking at um, what will 
uh, intramurals and what would club sports uh, look like following uh, guidance from some of our professional organizations like NURSA and uh, other uh, guidance from local state and, and federal uh, kind of requirements. So our goal and our plan is to have as robust as possible campus life, including uh, student organization events, uh, other events that are sponsored uh, by campus organizations, but doing those um, in a way that aligns with physical distancing re uh, responsibility requirements, um, but allow ongoing and consistent engagement for our students. Thank you. Next question is who will be responsible for properly equipping um, the campus in terms of cleaning services and cleaning spaces between classes? And who will be responsible for ensuring the physical distancing is maintained on campus? Um, and then a follow-up comment, it should not be the police. So I, I, can, I can start a bit and then I think everybody can weigh in that's on the panel because this has been a topic, it's really the first topic that we're dealing with, which, which is preparing the campus. Um, right now we have dozens and dozens and dozens of facilities people that are out there measuring measuring rooms, measuring conference rooms, measuring egresses, measuring uh, hallways to be able to figure out um, what the capacity of the rooms will be under this low density model. Typically you see it decline by about 50% uh, depending on the infrastructure. Uh, and I think it's really important for everybody to understand that we're doing it for the residence halls as well. Um, each university has different infrastructure. If you go to Goucher, the, their residence halls, their buildings were built in different eras than ours. So some of their rooms are much smaller than ours are, or they don't have the same type of HVAC. So the facilities people are, are measuring across the campus to be able to determine capacities that we're going to be using. And we should have those actually in the next few days. They're also taking a look at changes to the HVAC systems to be able to provide for the best ventilation and improve ventilation. Uh, we're looking at egresses. You might have, you know, when you go into grocery stores or you go into Target right now, there's an in and there's an out to be able to provide for the social distancing. We're going to have similar situations like that. Uh, so signage is going to go up. Uh, information about the egresses is going to go up. We're going to be looking at the capacities to be able to do that. And that's going to be across the campus itself. Um, so that's really the first step that we're looking at being able to do. Um, we, we, we are going to be a mask on campus. Uh, and we are going to socially distance and we are going to encourage the fact that you have to be able to uh, wash your hands. If you read all of this, everybody's aware of the fact that the virus itself could be with us for uh, you know, a while. Uh, and, and we have to be able to make adjustments in terms of what the CDC, the state and local authorities are telling us is the best practices associated with it. And we will install those on the, on the campus with regard to lowering the density, which is less people less often. Uh, and encourage that uh, and, and work to be able to have the buildings configured in the classes and the office spaces configured that way as well as the residence halls. But it's also on us to be able to uh, make sure that we socially distance, to make sure the fact that we uh, wash our hands frequently and that we do wear masks. Um, so we're going to set that up as a, as a standard on the campus itself to be able to work towards. Um, and it's, it's going to be a normative behavior that we're going to be able to establish. I'll, I'll ask um, uh, uh, Dr. Hurd if he would talk about um, how we're going to be educating the students, because I think we have the students with that and, and provost. Please talk about it in terms of class management as well, the conversations with the faculty, if you would. So, so a lot of uh, our effort this summer is going to be around uh, kind of campaign style communication to really prepare our student body for our shared responsibilities from a community standard standpoint to uh, all hands on deck uh, in terms of this quote unquote new normal. Uh, so that's going to be a big part of our efforts uh, this summer. I will also share that um, I'm really proud of our student leaders. Uh, I think our students understand uh, what's going to be required for us to uh, safely return to campus uh, and are really excited and thinking about ways that they can uh, be leading voices in terms of uh, setting culture and again, uh, creating the expectation and standard across campus. So that partnership, that collaboration, that kind of culture setting uh, and all hands on deck approach is going to be important going forward. And as far as the classroom management challenge, you know, we understand that that, that can be a challenge um, if a student, uh, for whatever reason, shows up and doesn't want to, to wear the mask and um, really would be treated as any other classroom management issue. 
We do have a group of uh, faculty and, and staff and students working right now, uh, looking at all of our policies, including student conduct policy. So, um, you know, we're, we're saying we're a mask on, and so there would be fir first, you know, effort is the educational piece, right? Um, that uh, Dr. Hurt just spoke of. There'll be signage everywhere. Um, it's part of the, just sort of, our, sort of our community values, and so our expectation is that those incidents will be few and far between. But should they arise, it'll be handled through the student uh, conduct process. And if I can add as well that there's going to be stations throughout campus and the facilities uh, subgroup is talking right now about how many in total, but somewhere in the range of 190 to 300 stations with hand sanitizer throughout the campus, concentrating on ingress and egress, elevators, uh, high touch points, if you will, and those will be constantly replenished by ABM, our, our vendor to both there and also as well as SOAP, they'll be keeping a close eye on that to make sure that uh, all those supplies are readily available to the campus. Thank you. Another question about facilities. Um, how will we, uh, when will we know how many students can be seated in instructional rooms and when capacities for, for different rooms are um, kind of set? Um, and when will we know which rooms are scheduled to be outfitted for the Panopto compatible technology um, that will take in obviously consideration the access and, and technology needed uh, for, for, for faculty uh, providing remote services? So I'm happy to t tackle that one. Um, we will know within a week uh, the room capacity. So uh, the facilities people are, are working very hard. They they're almost done. They've almost completed that that task. And so we will have that ready by the end of next week. So we'll identify what those capacities are. As far as the Panopto, we have a list of currently enabled rooms. And one of the working groups on the task force, um, th their entire focus is on uh, procuring and identifying uh, appropriate technology for these other rooms. And so we're going to at least double and, and likely more than double the number of rooms that have that uh, capability. So uh, the group's working on that and we will have those for everybody within a week or two. Thank you. Um, another question, and this one from a uh, virologist, let's see, said, have you considered having all members of the TU community have an antibody test prior to returning uh, so that the university has an estimate of the level of immunity present on campus? Also a question about the same, uh, in the same vein in terms of any concern about the increased risk of, uh, of uh, populations in terms of uh, the demonstrations going on in the activism right now. So I, I can start the question, uh, answer, start answering the question, and then I'll ask the provost to weigh in as well. So one of the benefits that we've had as universities that were part of the University System of Maryland, which has 12 universities, um, I've been meeting with uh, my leadership team in terms of uh, return to campus plans now for uh, probably for about two months, and we're meeting, you know, three times a week. We started out every single day, and now we're meeting three times a week as the implementation teams get active. Uh, we've met three times a week with the University System of Maryland. That's all the presidents, as well as members of their senior leadership team. Uh, we meet three times a week. And part of the plan for that is that we're making uh, decisions uh, that can impact all of the campuses, but making use of best practice across uh, all the system. And included in the system is an academic hospital and a medical school uh, that has noted experts in terms of epidemiology, virology, uh, and we are going to be uh, dependent on, and we are in fact made a decision as presidents with the chancellor's support that we're going to have one single method that we're going to use that's going to inform, and, and si as the provost says, science is going to inform us in terms of what we're going to do. Uh, so that's to come and that's being developed. I can tell you the fact that uh, over the past few weeks, there's been changes to the fact that test everybody when they come to campus to the fact that that is not actually uh, a sound um, uh, way to be able to manage it um, that really uh, symptom testing and uh, symptom monitoring and surveillance might be the way next but I'm saying the fact that there is a there's a team of scientists that are working in the medical school and working in the medical center to be able to do that 
And we're going to make full use of the resources that we have available across the system. Uh, we're fortunate in the fact that um, uh, uh, the provost is actually serving on the task team uh, that's working to coordinate some of those uh, activities across the system itself. So, Melanie, do you want to add more about the conversations that are having with regard to that? Sure. So, so as the president says, you know, we've said from from day one that we are going to let science dictate what we do, and so we have, you know, some of the best minds in the world uh, on this. And so, as that advice uh, shifts, so too will our strategy. But you can be confident in knowing that we are getting the sort of the cutting edge advice on that, and we're following it. And uh, you know, we've made a, as a, a premise that that this will dictate everything that we can do health and safety number one and and we are um we're listening and we are we will uh enforce best practices thank you um another question uh, this one's about ways in which towson is making decisions for the return is that based on guidance from the governor we know that the governor had a uh, an announcement yesterday moving us to phase two is it based on specific guidance from the chancellor or is it kind of TU's own call? Um, we were, uh, we, we started the process of the return, thinking about the return and what that would look like probably about uh, six weeks ago. And the process really started at the system level to be able to share um, uh, information, to be able to share resources. And again, we have a tremendous amount of expertise within the system itself. So to be able to get those minds together and get those best practices together to inform was the first step that we wanted to do. It started to crystallize and coalesce around the fact that, and I'm sure all of us have seen it across the country, that universities have been making decisions of what they what they were going to do. Um, and so we made the decision, as uh, as most of the University System of Maryland is doing, uh, the, our sister universities and sister campuses, is to be able to come back in the fall. But to a one, they're all looking at a lower density model uh, which fits with both CDC state and local guidelines. So the quick answer to that question is it's all of the above. Um, you know, we have, we will always be in compliance with CDC state and local directives. And it's important to realize it's also local because in the state of Maryland, uh, although the governor uh, can make uh, decisions in terms of what phase we go through in terms of reopening, uh, Baltimore, we're in Baltimore County, and based on the uh, conditions within the county itself, the county executive could tighten those. Uh, so that will inform our decisions as well. Uh, and then we're looking at what makes sense for our campus in terms of density and what makes sense for our campus in terms of uh, the fact that we're a residential campus. Some of the campuses are not residential campuses. Um, we're close to the resources of UMS that we're gonna make use of in terms of testing if needed and also taking a look at surveillance. Uh, as well as data gathering in terms of taking a look at, uh, uh, at at the information that we receive. If you're in Frostburg or if you're in Salisbury, it's it's going to be different resources that are going to support that. Uh, so the, the general answer is all of those are being considered, but we're also making sure that we're in alignment with the system as well as state and local uh, directives and, and the CDC. Health and safety is number one. Uh, and we're going to be guided the, by those, uh, uh, by all of, of those consideration, those directives first. Pros, do, did you want to uh, add more in terms of that? I think that's uh, that, that's it. That's where we are. Okay. <laughs> I think along those same lines, the question, uh, another follow-up question in terms of as the state reopens, and even the, if the presence of COVID nineteen remains, uh, but we have kind of a lower risk of transmission. Will the campus continue to support teleworking? at minimum for those who obviously have a high risk member of their household or are high risk themselves. And, and, and the other question is, when should we expect uh, that non-essential? So right, right now we know that essential workers are on campus. When should we expect in terms of timeline when those non-essential folks might begin to come back to campus? So, so I, I, you know, to make clear again, health and safety is first. Um, we understand the fact that there are unique situations in households. Uh, we understand that people have different risk propensities. We understand the fact there's different anxiety levels uh, that people have. And we want to be supportive and respectful across the board and realize that telework help is helpful because it's reducing the density of the campus. So it's, we're actually supportive of doing that. We have to get the work done. So we're going to have to work with supervisors and 
individuals are going to have to work with their supervisors and managers to be able to to figure that out. Um, but we want to be able to to encourage that. Um, as time goes on, we'll we'll take a look at what changes might be done. But but I can assure you the fact that we're going to be supportive of our of our faculty and staff as well as our students because the flexibility has to apply to them as well, given those conditions. Uh, in terms of the question of when we will know this, I think the provost said the fact that. What we're doing is the first thing we're doing is we're trying to figure out how many people can be in the buildings uh, and then from there be able to provide that information to the managers and the supervisors and the vice presidents to sort that out uh, and then we'll have uh, we'll be able to communicate that uh, uh, as soon as we have that we'll be able to figure out plans to be able to let people know but right now only essential workers are on campus so i just want to make that clear is that we have not invited people back to campus other than essential uh, because of the fact that we want to control and phase in that um, over the next uh, week. So I would think that in the next two to two weeks, we'll start giving more information out. Uh, so I would say two weeks from now is when people will first start hearing about some of the return plans that we'll have in terms of phasing people back to work. And it will be phased. We're not just going to flip the switch and everybody's going to come on. We will, we will bring it back first. Probably the first group that will come back are going to be researchers that will be coming back to campus. Then we'll took it in the next phase of essential workers. Um, so you'll be hearing from your uh, from your supervisors and from your managers. But as I said, the first step is to be able to figure out capacities and, and egresses, et cetera, so we can make sure the fact we can socially distance when we do return. Thank you. Another great question. Will faculty and students be told if they have come in contact with a COVID positive person or a person with COVID symptoms on campus? Alternative. Alternatively, will we, will we be told if we should self isolate? So we, 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 as I said, we're working with the university system and we're working with the uh, medical school. We will have a protocol for that. Uh, so, you know, in all likelihood, what we're going to do is to have people self monitor every day. We've ordered something like 300 uh, thermal thermometers. We're also going to provide digital thermometers to the students. Uh, to be able to do that. If somebody has a, uh, a symptom uh, that we're going to be setting up and standing up resources so that they can be able to report it and they can be able to receive counsel with that. It's all going to be based on health department and CDC guidelines to be able to do it. One of the things that we are doing as well is that um, uh, one of the towers, and I forgot which one, was supposed to come down for, um, uh, come offline, in fact, was brought offline with regard to having it renovated. We've paused on that renovation and that tower will become the, the tower for residents that need to self isolate. Um, and that's important for us to be able to have because of the fact that somebody either, comes, people can come down with the COVID-19 symptoms and they don't have to be hospitalized. Well, if we have residents on campus, we wanna be able to isolate them uh, so that they can basically be able to self care. Many people, can be able to take ibuprofen and, and get by it, or they have some level of symptoms that does not require it, but we want to be able to isolate them and monitor that. So we'll have that in place as well. And, and we're fortunate to be able to have that residence hall. There's other universities that are looking to rent out hotels and all sorts of things to be able to provide that, because that's necessary for us to make sure that the campus is safe. Okay, thank you. A, a number of questions about fall events um, in terms of sports events, per, uh, performances, exhibitions, and these are mostly internal events. We already know that external events and third party events have been canceled, but um, what about those events on campus that are within the community? Uh, what is our stance on that? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start that out and then give it to the provost and Dr. Hurt. You know, the first thing that I'll say is got to meet CDC state, federal, local guidelines in terms of social distancing and how many groups can gather and the social distancing requirements. So that, that's the first and foremost, but I, uh, Provost, Dr. Hurt, if you add in terms of those events on campus. Sure, so we, um, so absolutely that, that's the, the first premise and part of that will have to do with that facilities uh, room capacity analysis that's happening uh, right now. We also have a, a group of faculty who are looking at these particular issues as so 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 we know that the performing arts for example uh have some unique challenges that may be uh that are different from say uh, teaching an english class and so they've been tasked with uh looking at best practices uh, i know that there's a whole national discussion there's communities of practice that are taking place right now 
And so people are trying to understand how do we do theater? How might we have choral performance? And so all that work is, is taking place. Um, we would of course like to, to support those, but again, it all has to be done with the, the health and safety of our community in mind. So, so I'm, I'm confident that uh, the creative thinking that has already taken place on this campus will allow us to have some of those uh, events, but it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be in a modified form and, and, and we understand that. And uh, I look forward to seeing what creative solutions the, uh, the team proposes. All of those solutions will be reviewed by our health and safety team again, so that 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 we understand that that is uh, priority one. And, and I would just briefly add, um, even as we transition to virtual space at the end of uh, this past semester, we will continue to utilize the virtual space for programming, whether it's uh, student organizations, whether it's departmental. Uh, so again, keeping with this theme of uh, kind of hybrid delivery, both in the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. Uh, I think it's important to, again, as the, the provost noted, to set that expectation that in terms of large scale events, it will not look like uh, what it has in the past, we will likely be looking at uh, some type of limit to the number of uh, quote unquote large scale events, whatever way that is measured uh, based on the guidance at that time uh, in order to ensure that we're able to do it safely. Thank you. And Dr. Hurt, we'll keep it here with you. Given that beds will be reduced by about a thousand, um, and I'm not, and this is just a question. So, uh, Feel free to just chime in in terms of the, the numbers here. How will it be de determined which students can return to on campus living? Will more students be directed to off campus apartments or asked to commute? Yeah, so one of the things that we're uh, looking at is uh, what that model is going to be. We do know we will prioritize on campus housing for our freshman students. Uh, as we, we want our freshmen to be uh, on campus and, and have that experience. Um, many of the other institutions across USM are looking at uh, kind of a, a mileage reach, uh, ratio uh, in terms of uh, radius, I should say, uh, in terms of uh, what students uh, will uh, be asked to uh, commute to campus. So we're likely to uh, have a, a similar uh, kind of uh, policy in place. Uh, the other thing that we're doing is uh, we're in uh, discussions with potentially uh, looking at uh, other private uh, kind of partnerships uh, with uh, local uh, apartments uh, close to campus, a uh, new facility. Uh, we're, we're exploring the opportunity of uh, a master lease contract to be able to provide additional beds uh, for students. And so, uh, although we're reducing our beds uh, that have low dis density um, housing on campus, we're exploring other opportunities uh, to provide additional beds as well. Thank you. There's also a question about um, some of our contractual, our, our, our contract workers, some of our, such as our ABM employees um, and, and those who provide our cleaning services. Um, how is TU working to address the needs and vulnerabilities of our contract laborers? This might be a question for um, Vice President Lowenthal. Thank you, Marina. We have been working since the beginning of the pandemic with uh, all of our third party vendors, uh, big ones being ABM and Chartwells, to ensure that those folks uh, continue to have health coverage. Uh, clearly, there's there's reduced services on campus. So those individual institutions did have to do some layoff for their employees just to manage the current environment. However, we did ensure that all of those folks do have access to the days off that they need as it relates to the pandemic and they continue to have health coverage even during the layoff period. And that's something that um, we work with them from the beginning on. So we feel good that that, that, that coverage is still there. As we gear up, of course, um, a lot of those folks will be coming back on campus and will be back on the job uh, in order to provide for the campus as we gear up for the return. Thank you. There's also a question about PPE and, and the supply that TU will have and, and how that works with our employees. Is uh, One question is, is TU going to have a supply of PPE in all buildings, uh, particularly in student services office, um, offices? For example, this person works in the Academic Advising Center and wants to know if they will have masks in case a student comes and meets but doesn't have one. And then there's also additional questions um, about um, whether it's masks or just facial coverings um, that will be required. 
And the same is true in terms of faculty asking questions about whether or not they will be required to wear masks um, during lecture. So a number of PPE and mask questions that I think uh, a number of folks on the panel can address. So how about I start and then we'll kind of pass it around. Um, we, we have a subgroup that specifically is looking at PPE itself uh, because we know that we want to be able to have supplies on campus. Uh, so we will have supplies on campus for PPE in the event that somebody doesn't bring it uh, or, or forgets it. Uh, I think that by the time uh, we get to campus, I know that I have uh, three or four different masks that I have, the gator kind, uh, there's lots of different ones. Um, so if we're walking around uh, just Towson, Baltimore, Maryland, you're seeing that. So, uh, but we want to make sure that we're able to supply masks for those that, that need them. We will be supplying masks for students uh, in terms of the return and we will have uh, them available. Um, in terms of, of being able to source those, we've been very lucky uh, and very fortunate again to be part of the university system. So in terms of getting uh, PPE, we, we have a good supply of being able to have those. So uh, I, I'm confident that we'll be able to support the needs of the campus at that point. Uh, the question about um, would, they, would there be a, a, a face covering? Again, we, we, we're, we have a team that's taking a look at this. Uh, and so I'm not going to say yes or no. I don't know what they're going to come out with. But we're going to be very deliberate in terms of what we're going to communicate with people. And it's a cross-functional group that's dealing with that. Uh, so we want to make sure the fact that we can answer all these questions. And as I said, we have a team working on it um, where there are high traffic areas, which there are on campus. Uh, and you've probably seen that in various grocery stores. We're going to be putting plexiglass up. So there, there will be plexiglass. There'll be egress. There'll be PPE made available, sanitizers, low density. Uh, so what you're seeing uh, in our community is going to be mirrored in, uh, on campus itself. Uh, but I think the thing that's going to be um, uh, uh, different that we have to deal with is the residence halls as well as the classrooms in terms of the density itself and being scientific about how we manage that. Um, Provost, um, uh, Dr. Hurd, if you'd like to add anything, Ben. So I'll address just uh, very quickly the specific question about faculty and um, how faculty will handle uh, addressing their courses and do, do you have to have a face covering uh, during lecture? So uh, again, this will all of this is being determined right now, but we do know that there are rooms that are designed su such that there's 12, 15, sometimes even 20 feet between the front of the room and the first row of seats. And so in those cases, there may be an opportunity for a faculty member to, um, to speak without the, the mask. Again, we're gonna wait till we get the CDC guidance on, on that. There's also, we, you know, we've come up with multiple solutions. Uh, they're the clear uh, plastic shields, face shields that uh, people might uh, choose to use. So we've procured uh, a bunch of those. Um, so I know that there's concern, of course, for our students and faculty and staff who may uh, rely a lot on uh, lip reading. And that's a, a challenge, of course, when people have face coverings on. So we have that as an option as well. And we are also uh, exploring in uh, certain rooms, putting the plexiglass up between the lectern and the uh, and the, the desks, so that that would provide again a safe way for a faculty member to uh, continue to to lecture or have a discussion with their students um, without having necessarily to cover the face. So there's all sorts of options that are out there, and we are working. Um, every single day to get as many of those options in front of fa uh, faculty uh, to to meet the health and safety and also the individual comfort level of the faculty member. Great. Thank as you. the president uh, mentioned, I'll just say briefly, as the president mentioned earlier, we will be a mask on campus. So uh, the residential experience will be will be no different. Uh, the expectations will be that our students will uh, wear uh, face covering uh, in the residence halls, uh, particularly outside of their own um, residential uh, spaces, and that includes all the, the common areas. Uh, we'll also uh, look at installation of plexiglass and uh, whether it's the front desk of uh, the residential halls and other uh, appropriate areas. Thank you. Also, um, I know that we we're receiving a lot of uh, messages and feedback around um, the capacity issues we're experiencing. We apologize. We just want to remind everyone that a recording will be provided um, as soon as possible of, of this entire town hall. And so 
uh, we are moving as quickly as we can, and we know that some of you are experiencing um, or your colleagues might have reached out to you in terms of their inability to to get in, but we are working quickly to make sure that we can um, resolve some of those issues. Um, question um, has come in regarding um, our most vulnerable students and those who need um, who, who need to return to campus in order to have a place to stay, um, a consistent meal, internet access. What is being done about um, our students who need that support in terms of hardship? So I, I can start. I, I, I really appreciate that the question was offered. Um, I think that it's important to be able to recognize that for um, uh, a, a large number of our students, the safest place they could be is on campus. Um, we are also dealing with faculty and staff where um, uh, home is an abusive place and that having a place to go to, a place to work, colleagues, um, uh, is, is, is important both for their well-being as well as for their behavioral health. This is something that's, that's important and we want to be able to provide that because as the, as the individual said, um, it's a place where they get a meal. It's a place where they feel safe. And many of our most vulnerable community members have, have had uh, everybody struggle, but they've struggled in a way that's absolutely extraordinary. Um, we're going to be particularly supportive, and we have been supportive of those that are most vulnerable, both through the emergency fund that we've set up, which I'll ask Dr. Hurt to talk about. Uh, I'll also ask him to talk more about the behavioral health support that we're providing. Uh, to those individuals as well. So, uh, Dr. Hurt, can you do can you can you do that, please? Sure. Um, so, I, I do appreciate that that, that question as well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we want our students to be able to flourish and thrive uh, even in the midst of uh, the pandemic. And so, uh, you may recall uh, when we made the transition to to virtual uh, learning, uh, we did provide housing. Uh, an opportunity for students with uh, hardships. Uh, so that includes you know, students with uh, international students, students who may have uh, particular medical issues, uh, coming from low income uh, backgrounds, whatever the case may be. Um, and so we were able to stand that up. As we're moving forward, a part of our uh, finalization of room assignments this summer will be surveying our students uh, on the front end so that we can be able to um, make uh, earlier preparations for those students and, and really kind of give that that sense of uh, peace of mind. We've also uh, stood up a student support services uh, team that's working across student affairs and academic affairs. Uh, Dr. Anthony Skabakis, our associate vice president and dean of students, is providing leadership uh, for that group and really looking at assessing um, our student support services, uh, assessing the trends of needs uh, that we saw uh, at the end of this last semester to make sure that we have the right uh, supports in place. And that includes uh, our holistic health and wellness uh, uh, supports as well. Uh, in terms of emergency funds, uh, we uh, were able to distribute uh, a large sum of, of money uh, this, this past semester through our uh, emergency fund through the, the foundation, uh, as well as most recently through uh, the CARES Act uh, funding. Uh, we set aside uh, some of that funding specifically for the upcoming uh, academic year, recognizing that uh, we'll have students with needs uh, and we want to uh, ensure that we have a process to, to bet uh, deliver those funds uh, very quickly. We moved um, early on in the transition from uh, having about a, a two week two week process of delivery to being able to uh, deliver within uh, days, really. And so uh, I think we have a, a really great process in place and we'll have the resources uh, to be able to, to support uh, students, both what we know, uh, but again, nimble enough to be able to support those uh, issues that will arise from day to day. Thank you. We're also getting a number of questions. I know we talked a little bit about cleaning, but there's also questions about HVAC systems um, and some concern in certain buildings, a library, Hawkins, and even some of our older buildings. Um, Vice President Lowenthal, can you talk a little bit about how facilities is going into some of those more structural and, and HVAC um, measures that are that need to be taken in order to prepare for the campus return? Sure. Thank you. Um, the facilities folks are actually reviewing all buildings on campus. The way to manage this and the best way to manage it is to take all of the air out of the building and recirculate it completely, which we've budgeted for because we know that that is, it comes at a significant additional cost 
and uh, they are researching and again working with the, the folks and the experts at the system level at University of Maryland Medical System as well so in the UMB so that we know what is the recommended path forward and those conversations continue within the facility subcommittee as part of the return to you conversation that we're having so we are working to ensure the safety and security in every building on campus. Thank you. I think, and there's also a few questions about windows, uh, windows that don't currently open now and what measures might be taken to, to review some of those as well. And that's an excellent question. I appreciate that. And I'm sure that's uh, some of what we're discussing within the committee. And I'll be sure to pass that along as well. Again, the decisions are forthcoming. I'm not going to share anything at this point because they haven't yet been made, but they'll be made with uh, science is what's driving all of this. Um, I know we're, we're getting close to the hour, but we're, I'm going to keep going. We have quite a few questions and I want to get as many of them offered as possible or answered as possible. Um, one question is what will dining halls and cafes look like on campus? How will those, how will those be different? Well, I could start and kind of throw it both to Ben as well as to Vernon. Um, I think we're all seeing takeout. Um, I think we're all seeing grab and go. Uh, you know, we're going to follow again, uh, CDC, state and local in terms of doing things, but we also have to follow social distancing. Uh, I don't think we've made final decisions, but I can tell you a buffet sit down uh, is probably not in the, in the cards in terms of being able to do it as we typically would see it. Um, you know, that we're actually going to be taking a look at requirements to have either grab and go or, you know, certain menus that would be takeout to be able to do that. Um, you know, that's one of the things that the committees are working on as well, but it, it will not be as we've seen before. Um, but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give it over to, uh, to Dr. Hurd as well as to, to Ben in terms of what we've been working with in terms of, of chart wells, as well as some of the things that Dr. Hurd has heard from his colleagues across the country with regard to dining halls. I'll, I'll let Ben talk about chart wells in particular because I know they've been doing some great work in this area. Um, you know, we're going to be making some changes to to floor plans. Uh, you know, positioning of uh, tables and um, uh, chairs, uh, capacity at tables and chairs to really align with uh, again those physical distancing requirements. As the president shared. Um, what we're seeing nationally is uh, certainly an increase in grab and go options, um, really, you know, increase uh, in different types of uh, utensil use, uh, moving away from uh, glass uh, wear to uh, kind of plastic uh, disposable wear, um, keeping in mind also with sustainability uh, goals and requirements as well. And so I think that's what we're seeing nationally. That's what we'll see uh, as we move forward on campus. And I'll just add that we are working very closely with our partners, Chartwells, to ensure the safety and security. Uh, much of what the President Dr. Hurt mentioned already, and that it'll be grab and grow, go options. We are also installing uh, some of those plexiglass shields that we talked about earlier, so that at the checkout counters, which are, you know, very uh, very high activity, uh, they will be installed there, so that we can safely do any transactions that are required. And um, certainly Chartwells and we are both in touch with the national discussion on what ends up being recommended safety guidelines from both CTC and the experts in the field. Thank you. Okay, we're just about 11. I'm take a couple of more questions and I want to thank everyone who has submitted them. They've submitted them to me um in a number of ways so i'm trying to moving across platforms to try to make sure we get as many questions answered as possible one question was about uh research and what is being done provost to provide for the research that that uh, faculty obviously will have to uh, continue with uh, as well as working with students through that research so thanks that's a that's a great question so our intent is to uh to launch the research uh process early uh, in the in the next few weeks um, to start slowly bringing people back to to campus, and so we have a number of faculty who need access to their uh, research labs to be able to do that. Um, and when, here again, we're fi following pretty specific guidance uh, from our colleagues in USM regarding again the, the health and safety. And there's particular um, concerns, of course, unique to uh, research practice that we need to to follow. And so. Just as one example, uh, the uh, faculty involved in the, the research labs 
will be provided with the N95 uh, masks because we know they need a higher level of protection just based on the activity that typically takes place. And so we are working right now um, with creating a very specific set of protocols for the return to research. So all faculty who uh, would like to come back to campus to take part in uh, research to restart up their labs have a process they need to go through which identifies what the activity is, who's going to be in the lab, what you know, what are uh, the the preparations for um, for PPE, uh, what do you need, what's the cleaning regime you need. Uh, this is quite an elaborate questionnaire that is go going to go out to all those uh, those faculty. We're finalizing that right now. Uh, so I've been working closely with Dean Vanko and Dean Plowfield, and I expect to have uh, that ready to go uh, within the next two days. And so that will be issued to faculty. Uh, those questionnaires will come back in. We'll make sure that we are prepped and that the faculty are prepped and uh, any students who are uh, doing that research with them are uh, are also prepped and then we can start returning uh, to research. So, so again, that will be a phased in return. We won't have, you know, mass return of, of faculty at, at one time, but we think we can uh, sort of stage that research practice and build up slowly over the summer in a safe way. Um, and uh, so we're really looking forward to doing that. One quick additional note, I know there were concerns from research faculty and the fact that Central Receiving has only been operating on reduced hours, Mondays and Thursdays during the pandemic in order to facilitate the research starting back up starting June 15th, Central Receiving will be back at their full hours. Thank you. Another question um, in regards to, and I think that we've answered this one, but um, just making sure that we're covering all our bases about contact tracing. Will contact tracing apps be used? Um, what about asymptomatic employees and how are we protected from them in terms of thermometer checks and fever checks? Will all of those precautions be in place? The president is nodding and I know that she's covered quite a bit of this in terms of um, our connection with the system, but um, I think it doesn't hurt to reinforce that one. As I as I should well, first of all, mask on is how you deal with asymptomatic. I think everybody realizes that as well as social distancing and and uh, and uh, hand cleaning. Um, so we're we're going to be making use of the directives that we're getting from both the system as well as the state and the CDC. Um, and so all of those are going to uh, be involved with that. We're also going to be working with the Department of Public Health, the local Department of Public Health, in terms of reporting. There was a question before, are we going to, uh, you know, do contact tracing on the campus and surveillance? And the answer is yes, there's a requirement to be able to do that. We are looking at some apps, um, uh, you know, and, and again, we're not looking at them. We're going to rely on uh, UMB and the medical system. Uh, we're fortunate in the fact that we have a chancellor who's a pediatrician who used to be the uh, uh, president of UMB. So I can share with you the fact that Jay is very, very interested in these and we have scientists that are involved in it. Uh, so we're very, very fortunate to have the resources and what we'll be doing is we'll be adopting the standards and the protocols associated with uh, both testing, contact tracing, surveillance and reporting um, across the system to be able to do that. So there's more to come and, and we will let everybody know what those are once they're finalized. Um, as the provost said, and as I shared, um, there's change associated with this, the more we know uh, or the more they know that there's been some modification to what are the best practices associated with it, but we'll make sure that we're compliant with those uh, recommendations and we'll share what those are as soon as they are finalized. Thank you. Another question about travel. We already know that university sponsored out of state travel um, has been suspended for the fall semester. What about uh, travel that is not university sponsored, um, perhaps grant sponsored or even personal travel outside of the state? How will that, uh, are there any limitations to that is the question. So I'll start with that and then turn it to the provost. Part of the reason for the travel is, one is, is for expense. Um, as we talked about is the fact that, you know, we're, we're trying to pull our, our belts tight so that we can make sure that uh, we personal actual actions are a last resort for us. Um, but it's also a way to just reduce uh, factors that could influence outbreaks. So to be able to limit the amount of travel that we have just to Maryland and to uh, District of Columbia kind of prevents that. Uh, but a lot of that decision was also just expense related. 
the provost can talk about the fact of uh, research because that really informs the decision on grants as well. So, right. So if you, if it's a grant funded travel, you're uh, allowed to do that. However, there, the guidance remains in place that if you are traveling to a CDC level three, uh, you can't, you can't go. <laughs> you, uh, you know, we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't support that. Um, if you do, so imagine it's a lower level and then it turns to a higher level during your time or something like, like that, you will be required as in the past to go through a four, 14 day uh, self-isolation period before coming back to campus. So, so all those CDC rules still re remain in place even for grant funded uh, travel. Thank you. Another question is about health center and student services and counseling center and what types of services will will be available to students in the fall. So the the vast of uh, student services that are available to students uh, normally will be available in the in the fall. Our offices will be open, uh, including the health center, the counseling center. Uh, but we do recognize that uh, there will be students who will want to continue to engage uh, virtually, uh, and so uh, we're continuing to plan to have both uh, kind of face to face. Uh, appointment based uh, using physical distancing, social distancing, uh, but also continuing a uh, number of the uh, virtual engagement. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight the, the counseling center uh, was was quite successful uh, in being able to stand up, whether it's virtual groups, uh, one on one counseling options uh, for students who uh, that was the mode of uh, connection that was most comfortable. And so uh, we're going to continue to look at uh, how do we expand modality both face to face. Uh, and through virtual means. Thank you. Um, also, some questions about winter commencement, um, as, as well as the um, rescheduled commencement that um, for our class of 2020 that um, would occur in the fall. Um, President or or provost, uh, do you want to address those two questions? Well, um, I can start and, and then have the provost uh, respond as well. Uh, the winter commencement in December, we're basically going to take a look at what we have then in terms of social distancing requirements to be able to do it. Um, so, you know, as of now, we'll be able to have it in the way that we typically do with having CQ Arena fill. Uh, the answer is no, but we'll have to see what the guidelines are from the state and the CDC as we move forward. So we're constantly looking at those. Uh, we're going to be announcing uh, the commencement um, in the next week or so, Provost, I think. Uh, in terms of the date that we're going to be providing that in October, and we are going to be having an on campus commencement. Uh, and as I said, it should be announced in the next week or so so that people can plan for that. And we're looking forward to welcoming back the class of 2020 to participate in that. President Chatel, may I reveal where the location of th that? <laughs> yes, you can, sure. Okay, so get ready, everybody. It's an outdoor commencement at United Stadium. It's the only way we uh, can figure out to do the physical distancing, but we're confident we can. There's a whole team that's worked very, very hard uh, to plan how we can have a physically distance yet still meaningful and fun and celebratory face-to-face -face, uh, commencement. And so there's gonna be some surprises in store, um, some pretty fun ones that are being planned. So, uh, you know, I think we really, you know, we owe it to those students to do the best we can by them because They've been through a, a, a heck of a lot, as have we all, but we really want to celebrate them and make it, it special. So there's a team that's really, really worked hard to do that. And so uh, so if you have some sort of go away rain dance, uh, please do that throughout the month of October. Good. Thanks, Provost. I didn't want to put you on the spot by having you announce, so I appreciate that you were able to do that. A couple of more housekeeping questions, and then I promise we'll let you go. <laughs> ben, uh, will receiving will central receiving begin deliveries as well um, on June fifteenth? That was a question in terms of central receiving deliveries. So central receiving will be back to regular operations, so that would include the delivery process uh, starting the fifteenth. There's actually a, a next week will be sort of a pilot. So they won't be back full time next week, but they're gearing up towards the 15th. The answer is yes. Excellent, thank you. And uh, the the last question um, 
we want they need clarification on whether or not online instruction begins on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving or after the Thanksgiving break. So I believe we've stated that the online begins on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving uh, to start that transition. Okay, thank you. Um, one more. There's so many. There's so many great questions. I think we've gotten to most of them. How will we be able to safely use computer labs, com computers, and all those shared uh, spaces, such as um, those in the library that we know a lot of students re um, rely on? You know, I, so, and, you know, I can I can jump in, and then the provost can. Uh, you know, this is all this this that's a great question, and that's part of what the facilities group is taking a look at. Um, you know, in terms of not just density, but how can we make sure that if we have items that are high touch surfaces, which computers are, that we can properly make sure that they are, are, are clean. Uh, you know, we already know the fact we're going to use elevators, we're going to use doors, we're going to make egresses open. Um, but one of the areas is also taking a look at the computer labs as well. So I know that the facilities group is looking at that, not just density, but taking a look, how can we make sure those surfaces are clean uh, and, and the recommendations are going to be coming out of that. Um, Provost, and I know, I know you looked at it with the, with the folks in the library as well. Right. So, so just to reiterate that uh, as President Schatzel sort of began with, um, maybe this is a nice, nice bookend, the campus that you return to is not going to be the campus you left. And so the uh, facilities, people are working in, again in conjunction with health, health and safety to look at every single space so that the, there'll be spacing between uh, computers. There may be plexiglass dividers between computers. There may be uh, hand sanitizer stations everywhere, right? So it's going to look quite different uh, than it does today. Uh, we may open up other areas as computer labs that weren't used as computer labs before to ensure that uh, we have that spacing. So we know for certain the d density in the library will not be uh, what it was, but we do want to provide students with access to computers. We know that's a you know a really critical part of uh, their education under any circumstance, and certainly is elevated under our current high flex model. And so we'll be looking at uh, building out places that can serve as uh, additional uh, computer labs for students. So um, so we you know we're we're confident we can do this, but it will. It will take some time. Um, my goal would be to open the library on a modified schedule earlier than um, than the the classrooms to start to understand again the the flow and the cleaning regimes uh, that are necessary. So we'll it, it's all part of phasing in slowly to understand uh, what we can do safely and what our strategies uh, ought to be going forward. Well, one thing that I'd, I'd ask Dr. Hurt as well as the provost to mention, I think we've talked about the fact that we're going to be bringing the freshmen in a week early. Um, and of course, when it comes to the low density residence halls, we're making freshmen a priority uh, so that they will get the, the, the opportunity to be on campus and they will get the opportunity to be supported as they transition to their university life here at Towson. Um, but can the two of you talk about the rationale for bringing the, the freshmen in even a week earlier than than the opening of classes. So I'll I'll jump in and maybe Dr. Hurt can uh, can chime in as well. So so the the idea so so freshmen of course always come in earlier uh, than the other students to go through uh, orientation um, and prepare for the transition to college life. What we've decided to do on under the current circumstances is to bring even a, a few days earlier than that to uh, work on some of the uh, specific challenges that will exist uh, under the, you know, what the what fall 2020 will look like to really facilitate in a deep way that bonding uh, to each other, to TU, um, uh, understanding that the academic classes, all, all of those sorts of how to work in an online environment, how to work in a hybrid environment. And so uh, we think uh, bringing folks in a little bit earlier will give us the time to do that again in a physically distant uh, manner. So there may be, you know, we'll be running uh, people where we used to be able to address 600 students at a time. Uh, you know, we, we may be addressing 100 at a time. And so this will allow that really critical bonding, the preparation for the new academics, um, all of that to take place. Um, 
these students, our incoming freshmen, were, were yanked out of their high school classes abruptly, just as our college students were. And so this will give, a, a we think, an opportunity to uh, understand what their academic uh, uh, vulnerabilities might be and uh, start addressing those um, in, a, in a more direct way. So uh, Dr. Hurt, you wanna add to that? Yeah, I would just say this is, um, you know, the research shows us the, the efficacy of uh, summer bridge experiences. So this is uh, really aligns with best practices and an opportunity to both prepare uh, to build that sense of community connection to campus, uh, but also uh, get a sense for us as how the, the transition from the K-12 experience into college um, impacted their level of preparation and it allows us to uh, also do some data gathering, if you will, about what our students are coming in with. Um, and that information will help inform everything from kind of course delivery to also uh, what student services we want to make sure are available and targeted uh, to our new students. Thank you. And I want to thank the panel. There are a number of questions that we will continue to answer and, and, and put into our frequently asked questions on the return to TU website. Um, and I want to thank everyone that's uh, been a part of the call. We will also send out the recording of this um, to all faculty and staff. So if you receive the invite to this, you will also receive a notification when the recording is posted online. President Schatzel, anything else that you want to add? Um, I just want to say that I've been looking at my my phone, uh, not a lot, but a, a bit, um, and saw the fact that there were thousands of people that participated in this. And I know that we had some technology glitches in the fact that there were people that couldn't get in or couldn't see the video. Uh, so I just want to reinforce what, what Marina offered, uh, which is the fact that the entire recording uh, will be available. Um, and I get the feeling the fact that we should do this again. Um, I, I want to make sure the fact that we can um, you know, answer questions and, and get ideas from everybody and make sure that we're able to do that. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, and I'm seeing things pop up on the screen, the fact that yes, that's a great idea. Um, so uh, we, we will do this again. Uh, you know, we'll probably do it maybe in another week or so. We'll do it two weeks from now so that we can keep having everybody uh, uh, informed. Um, it, you know, it, it's, as the provost said, it's not gonna be the same uh, when we come back. Um, but we're going to be in it together, and I think we see our communities are together to be able to do that. Uh, but I'm confident that working together that that this is going to be a fantastic fall. It will be different, um, but we're going to do everything we can to make it successful. Uh, so I just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, just everyone, for supporting each other and for supporting our students. And, and we will have another town hall, as I said, in a couple of weeks. So thank you for participating. Thank you. We're getting a lot of thank you notes and saying, yes, this was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do this again. With that, go Tigers. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, colleagues. Go Tigers. Oh.